When I heard it, it was like I could scream. Like, you know, like with happiness, because now we found the closure. Tonight, family hold a vigil to honor Crystal Saunders. Finding the child care that suits her needs and my needs, that's been one of the biggest difficulties. Why child care spots are hard to come by in the Northwest Territories. And the Algonquis broomball team sweeps out the rest of the competition. Good evening and welcome to APTN National News. I'm Savannah Kelly. Dozens gathered at a vigil to honor a Métis woman whose body was found in rural Manitoba 17 years ago. Her family says they now have closure this week after RCMP announced a man has been charged with her death, but says that the announcement also reopens old wounds. Tamara Pimentel has more. It's been nearly 17 years since the death of 24-year-old Crystal Saunders. At the Mamawichita Center in Winnipeg, many gathered around a sacred fire with the sounds of Métis fiddling to honor her and offer supports to her family. Cynthia Roulette is the grandmother to Saunders' cousins and remembers her as playful and bubbly. She says she often relives the day she found out about Saunders' death. I said, oh my God. Like, this isn't happening. It can't be happening. Like, the little girl that I saw in the coffin wasn't the crystal that I knew. And I'm sorry I ever went up to the coffin because that isn't what I wanted to remember her as. In April 2007, Saunders was last seen by a Winnipeg police officer getting into a vehicle on Sargent and Sherbrooke Street in Winnipeg's West End. RCMP found her body the next morning in a ditch near St. Ambrose. DNA was found on Crystal's remains and due to advancements in technology, that DNA linked to Kevin Q. Last week, Q was charged with second degree murder for Saunders' death. The news her family waited almost two decades to hear. When I heard it, it was like I could scream. Like, you know, like with happiness, because now we found the closure. The family has the closure. I mean, we were one of the lucky families that got the body and got to bury it. But we never, ever thought that we would get or f ever, ever find out who the killer was. But now that has come true, too, which is wonderful for the family. Far too often, the Mama Wichita Centre has been holding these vigils. The city has been called the epicentre for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. Kat Patinode with Manitoba Métis Federation says identifying a woman's nation is crucial to offer supports to families. Previously, Crystal Saunders has been identified as a member of the Seguin First Nation. It wasn't until RCMP announced Q's arrest when the community learned she was actually Métis from Winnipeg. And it's not enough to say somebody's Indigenous. It's 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 great because then we at least know that she's you know somewhere within our extended you know kinship network. But we need to know because then we need to be able to just not just rally behind the family, but rally behind the community and the communities that are affected by it. So it is a broader than uh, it is a broader issue and a, a broader matter and. Uh, it needs to be addressed. It has to be distinctions based. It has to be that way so that we can provide the culturally appropriate supports that they need. While the RCMP's work on Saunders' case brings hope to those families that don't have closure, Patinode says the news reopens old wounds. I mean, it's resolution to, you know, to an intensive amount of work by the RCMP, which we thank them for, but it's the beginning of a lot more conversation uh, and a lot more healing. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Winnipeg. Soon after he was elected last October, Manitoba Premier Wab Kanu promised to have a Winnipeg landfill searched. It's believed to contain the remains of two First Nations women, victims of an alleged serial killer. Kanu wants a search to start this year, but Manitoba needs federal help, which has been promised by Ottawa last September before Kanu was elected. Today, Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu was asked whether a deal with Manitoba had been completed. She answered that Crown Indigenous Relations Minister Gary Ananda Sangaree is the one responsible. 
Listen, this is something my colleague Minister Andon Sankery is largely in, in charge of, but I did meet with Minister uh, Premier Kinu just about two weeks ago. It's still a priority for them, and we've uh, reassured Manitoba that we'll, we'll work closely with them as they decide how to take those next steps. The, the Manitoba chief has a, have a report about the, the actual search. Uh, should that report be made public? I, listen, you'll have to ask Minister Andon Sagri about the mechanisms, but what I would just say is that this will be a complex piece of work, as many reports have indicated, and yet the suffering of the families is paramount for, I think, all of the elected leaders that are working on the issue. Okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Today is the day the jury for the inquest into stabbings on the James Smith Cree Nation and in the nearby village of Weldon will be giving their recommendations. The media, family members and those affected by the tragedy were recalled early to hear what the jury decided. Right now, jury members are getting ready to share their recommendations inside the auditorium of the Cary Vicar Centre in Melfort, Saskatchewan. As this is not a trial, the jury will not assign blame. Instead, they will make recommendations to prevent similar deaths from happening in the future. We don't know exactly what those recommendations are just yet. We do know that they received their instructions from Coroner Blaine Beaven yesterday morning, and despite having the rest of the weekend to deliberate, they took just a day and a half to decide on recommendations. Reporter Rachel May is currently observing the inquest. She will have more details tomorrow. An Edmonton man who pled guilty to manslaughter was sentenced today. Elliot McLeod received seven years in prison in the stabbing death of 33-year-old Sherry Gauthier. In 2020, McLeod began talking to Gauthier and the two walked towards a downtown mall near midnight. Once in the parking garage, McLeod stabbed the 33-year-old Cree mother of five three times. She managed to walk far enough to ask for help but died shortly after in the hospital. McLeod's defense has said his history of trauma and methamphetamine addiction was to blame. With credit for time already served, McLeod has 18 months left in his sentence. This week, the special interlocutor for missing children and unmarked graves is in Iqaluit, Nunavut to speak with residential school survivors. There were 14 residential schools in Nunavut, the last being Kavalik Hall, which closed in 1996. This is the first of such gatherings in the Inuit homeland, or Inuit Nunungut. Special interlo interlocutor Kimberly Murray is gathering recommendations from survivors to protect the graves of children buried on residential school grounds and to develop ways for them to conduct searches. Another issue is the lack of records as to how many people were sent to schools or TB sanitariums in the south. Navalik Tuling Tulanganik, sorry, of Cambridge Bay went to Stringer Hall, the Inuvik Residential School. You know, it's really important that this work is done, and I'm, I'm really honored that I'm still alive to see the work is beginning, and to continue doing it all the way until it's all resolved. And my parents and grandparents, they're not alive, but I want to speak for them and to honor them for this and that I want to congratulate all the leaders and survivors, organizers to do stuff like this. And that gathering ends on Thursday. We want to hear what you think about this or any of the other stories you see here tonight. Here's how to continue the conversation. If you have a story you want to share, send us an email to news at aptn.ca. To read and watch our stories, visit our website at aptnnews.ca. You can find us online on your favorite social media sites, including TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and X. Follow APTN News to join the conversation and see our latest stories. We need to step aside for a short break, but still ahead, investing in Indigenous youth mental health in Manitoba. Plus, we speak with early childhood educators in the Northwest Territories about the barriers they face in their field. We've been viewed as babysitters a lot, so this is not what we do. We play a crucial role for child's growth and development, and we just need better uh, circumstances around us to be able to work. Welcome back to APTN National News. 
First Nations in Ontario want the Ford government to put a one-year moratorium on mining claims. The Chiefs of Ontario say the number of claims staked on their territories has gone up 30% in the past year and it's too much to deal with. With more on this story is CTV's Sergio Arangio. This method of claim staking was replaced several years ago in Ontario with online tools. But First Nations chiefs say it subverted the need to consult with Indigenous communities and respect their treaty rights. Ontario Regional Chief Glenn Hare says a one-year pause on further mining claims is needed, writing in a statement a 365-day moratorium is necessary as it will give First Nations communities the time that is required to assess the impacts of the Mining Lands Administration system. The effects of the mine claims currently being staked, as well as develop a process whereby meaningful and fulsome engagement and consultation can be integrated into the Mining Land Administration system processes. But a Timmins Area Prospector Association says people rely on claim staking to make a living. Uh, people will stake a lot of claims because it's not very expensive and they may not do anything with them, but they, they can hold them for two years and uh, maybe if they can vend them to somebody or get somebody interested, uh, they might make some money, but I would say uh, a good 80% of those claims are going to drop within two years. So it's not... Uh, not that big of an issue. McCray says mining companies are still required to consult with First Nations before beginning any work. The province said this on the matter. Ontario meets the Crown's duty to consult obligations on all resource projects across the province. The Aboriginal Participation Fund supports First Nations throughout the consultation process and resource revenue sharing agreements continue to provide partners with long-term economic support. Ontario will continue to chart a path towards meaningful reconciliation as we look to improve the health, social and economic well-being of all First Nations. McCray adds that a one-year moratorium on mining claims may affect investments in Northern Ontario. The Chiefs of Ontario argue that First Nations should be involved from the start and that a pause offers time to help sort out their concerns and ensure that treaty rights are not violated further. They want consultation to be made a part of the online claim staking process. Sergio Rangio, CTV News, Timmins. The Arctic Winter Games are in Alaska this year beginning March 10th. And that means athletes, coaches and families will need passports. NDP MP Lori Idlaut says young athletes in Nunavut are in danger of missing the Arctic Winter Games. She says it's because Service Canada does not process passport applications in the territory. Idlaut raised the issue in the House during question period on Wednesday. Here's the exchange between Idlaut and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. The Honourable Member from Nunavut. Nunavut athletes who earned their spot at the Arctic Winter Games in Alaska risk missing out because in Nunavut, Service Canada does not process passports. My office was helping until this government put even up more barriers. Families are now forced to pay thousands of dollars to fly down south to get their passports expedited or not compete at all. Can the minister ensure Nunavut has access to the same services as the rest of Canada? Sure. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. For the question, I know it's an important one for families across Nunavut, and that's why uh, we're committed to working to resolve this issue. I was just up in Nunavut uh, for a historic announcement around devolution uh, a few weeks ago, uh, working directly with the Premier to demonstrate how we build a stronger future together. Uh, this is an issue that I know the Minister is engaged with. We will look for solutions. Uh, we want to make sure that our young uh, Nunavut athletes uh, show what they're capable of at the Arctic winter games go Canada go go Nunavut go as Canada rolls out its plan for more accessible and affordable child care parents and early childhood educators in the Northwest Territories say there's still issues that need addressing our reporter Charlotte Mark Jacobs brings you that story Brittany Bassett is living her dream. She's a student in the two-year early learning and child care diploma program at Aurora College in Yellowknife. Today's assignment, organizing a playgroup centered in Northern Indigenous culture. So just being able to show the kids it, and there's a huge portion of me that is just like, 
reliving and the, the little ones, it's like, oh, they're actually learning and they want to learn. But it hasn't been easy. The challenges of it have been mainly being a single mom and also finding the child care that suits her needs and my needs. That's been one of the biggest difficulties, but it's like also one of the biggest pushes to being like, okay, well, I know what kind of center I want to open. She hopes one day to open her own child care center. But in the meantime, there's uncertainty in the field. In 2021, the territorial government signed a $51 million deal with Ottawa to cut the cost of child care down to $10 a day by 2026 and add 300 new spaces. But with over 500 names on the Yellowknife Daycare Association waitlist alone, that target still leaves families in limbo. We really need more spots for infants and toddlers. Like, this is not enough for the whole city of 20,000 plus people. Having only two or three daycares with, like, not even 50 spots in total and some home daycares, this is not enough. Program instructor Antula Zaku says the sector needs more support. We just need more awareness on that, more research, more people to advocate for us. Because traditionally, as you said, we've been viewed as babysitters a lot, so this is not what we do. We play a crucial role for child's growth and development, and we just need better uh, circumstances around us to be able to work. And Outside of the capital city, many remote communities lack daycare-appropriate buildings. So the GNWT is trying to attract new day home providers with pilot programs that allow renters in public housing to operate and financial help to retrofit homes. Trouble is, there's been zero interest. Uh, sometimes we hear that accessing professional learning can be a challenge, so and that may or may not be the same in centre-based programs, but mm -hmm. we try to be responsive in terms of when we offer professional learning to provide lots of opportunities for people to be flexible around that. Another criticism from providers, how NWT's subsidy structure is not keeping up with inflation, limiting operators from increasing fees between 2 and 6 percent, depending on their total fee rates. NWT Director of Early Learning and Child Care System Transformation, Shelley Capraline, says they are now providing more training for day home providers and they are working on a retention initiative fund with the creation of a wage grid by 2026. The way we're talking about a wage grid is setting a minimum standard um, for educators that recognizes the hours and um, experience of work. So it would be an hourly wage that they could expect at a minimum to receive. Programs could do more than that, but it will allow everyone to know at a minimum what they would make. In the NWT, ECEs can make $18 to $22 an hour at a centre, but many take their diploma to the school board to earn $35 an hour with summers off working as a teacher's assistant. That's the direction Jonathan Whitford plans to go. He's an ECE student who sees a big demand for educators in the classroom. It does make it a little bit difficult. Now, instead of having one teacher to 25 kids, you've got four teachers in a room at any given time sometimes. Like, kids is always what I wanted to teach. It's always been that, it's always molding their minds, molding their futures. Even with the changing industry, these educators remain hopeful. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, ABTN National News, Yellowknife. We need to take one more quick break. Still to come, an all-Indigenous women's broomball team wins big in New York. I've been playing since I could walk. I'd like to say 25 years, could be more. I'm 30 now, so I, was, I must have been before five years old. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. Thanks to Lynn Wright for today's photo. This magnificent scene is from Terrace, British Columbia. Looks like it could be early evening, almost a quiet, eerie sort of scene. Thanks for sharing that, Lynn. Send those photos to share at aptn.ca if you want to be our next photo of the day. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Over to the east coast, one degree in Halifax, minus one in Snowy in Fredericton. Nain Sunshine, minus 21. Happy Valley Goose Bay, minus 19. saint Jovite zero degrees there. Montreal, minus one and snowy. Ottawa, snowy, plus four there. Sault Ste. Marie, plus four in rain. Capus Casing, snowy and minus four. Sioux Lookout, minus two. Puckatawagan, minus one there. The Paw, zero degrees and rainy. Dauphin, rainy and plus one. Brandon, sunshine, plus two. 
Swift Current, 13 degrees in sunshine there, North Battleford, plus 7. Stony Rapids, 3 degrees in sunny, Meadow Lake, plus 4. Sunshine and 6 degrees for Fort McMurray, high level, plus 2. Edmonton and Red Deer, sunshine and plus 7. Kamloops, rainy and 12 degrees, Campbell River, rainy and 9 degrees. Fort Nelson, snowy and 2 degrees, Prince George, plus 11. Watson Lake, snowy and 2 degrees there, Dawson, minus 27. Wrigley, snowy and minus 18, Fort Liard, flurries and minus 10. Politux, sunshine, minus 25 there, Inuvik, minus 27. Baker Lake, minus 14, Cambridge Bay, snowy and minus 23. Arctic Bay, minus 26, and sunshine there, Clyde River, minus 21. It was a thrilling finish in overtime as an all-native women's team walked away with the B Championship at the Can-Am Broomball Tournament in Syracuse, New York. The players came from three First Nations in Quebec. Annette Francis spoke with the team captain about the win and what it means. Broomball is a huge part of Lorraine Nottaway's life. I've been playing since I could walk. I'd like to say 25 years, could be more. I'm 30 now, so. I, was, I must have been before five years old. And she continues to play near her home in Gatineau, Quebec. I'm actually in the league in Chesterville. It's competitive broomball. And I also um, run practices at the Slush Puppy Arena with uh, our students from Barrier Lake. So when she heard about the Can-Am tournament, she jumped on board. It was a chance to compete at a higher caliber. She put a team together of women from two Cree communities and her own Algonquin community of Rapid Lake. And the Algon Crees were born. I got like a, like a line from each community, you know, like with Swanapee, there was five players there, with Skagnish, there's three players there. In Rapid Lake, there's like five players there. So the lines worked. There was, there was chemistry in the ice in that way. That chemistry did work. Without even one practice together, they made it to the B Championship game, winning 3-2 to two in overtime. We were down two points and then we caught up and took it to overtime. And uh, who scored was uh, my cousin Tanya in Ottawa. Ottawa says it was a great feeling to win. Their jerseys reflect the nations on the team. But there's more to them. They include a light blue and pink ribbon to spread awareness about Cree leukocephalopathy, a genetic disease that affects the brain development of infants. It's fatal. One of our players actually lost her daughter uh, to that disease like a few months ago. The Algon Cree's team plans to compete in the provincial broomball competition in April and the World Championships in France this fall. And at Francis APTN National News, Gatineau, Quebec. Congratulations on the win and best of luck at your next tournament, ladies. And that's all the time we have here tonight on APTN National News. For news anytime, head over to our website at aptnnews.ca. I'm Savannah Kelly, Marcy Miigwech. Thank you for joining us. Have a great night.